What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of The Crazy Ones, the greatest startup show on planet Earth. First of all, I want to give a shout out to our awesome listeners who have written in from literally every corner of the globe. Our producer, Raymond, was telling us we have heard from listeners in Scotland, Korea, Switzerland, US. I feel like uh, a broken record, but it's just such a cool thing that we have going. So I just want to... um Keep the momentum. If you haven't yet written in to us, please do so. Jesse and I look at every email. We write back to all of our listeners. We love hearing your stories. And also, selfishly for us, we hear about your challenges. And so that informs what we actually talk about on the show. So shoot us an email at the crazy ones at morningbrew.com. Say what up and uh, let's get the conversation started. Jesse, you ready to do this thing? Let's do it. What's up, everyone? I'm Alex Lieberman. Yo, this is Jesse Pucci. And this is The Crazy Ones. Okay. So I feel like the the most organic conversations we've had have been just like when we explore what's going on in each other's worlds and and we go deeper into basically the, the challenges, the interesting learnings we're having from building our businesses. So I want to start with you. What's uh, What's been going on in the, the Gateway X world for the last week? Uh, I'll I'll start in a weird place, which is I'm sick this morning, mm. and and I'm sure anyone listening like there's nothing more humbling than being like, oh, damn it, like my brain feels foggy and I'm a little tired, and like I don't want to get out of bed this morning. And you know, I I think I I bring that up just because like I think when you're on Twitter and you're all these things, people are just like, oh Jesse, oh you know, and it's like. Sometimes it's like, man, yeah, I'm just a person, and I'm sure our people are there, are people too. And I think people throw so much guilt at themselves, you know. And I'm sure you're you're guilty, and I'm guilty of it too. But it's like, yeah, sometimes you you're sick. It's okay, you know. Um, so I don't know. I, that was, that just came up for me thinking this morning. And, and entrepreneurs get sick too. Maybe that should be a T-shirt. Yeah, seriously. Uh, Is there anything you try to do also. to just like be able to like? try to be productive today or do you just accept the fact that today maybe is just going to be a little bit less productive of a day probably the latter i mean it, it depends on how sick i am i've actually found that there is a zone where i get so sick that it's just it's not worth it to do anything yep um and that's today, usually if i can days. sit like no i don't think so uh but tomorrow might be you know how the sick, yeah, yeah, yeah. sick works um but if i if like i can't sit like this for 15 minutes like sit upright i'm like yeah forget it i'm i'm done because it's, it's also like, you put, just like anything, you put a low quality, you know, you're low quality in the meetings, you're low quality, and it's just like, no, you might as well just opt out. Totally. And by the way, to your point about just like um, how entrepreneurs tend to be really hard on themselves, it, it really is this like very tough balance because, I mean, I'm hard on myself about a lot of things. I'm hard on myself when... I feel like I haven't got done a good enough job in work. I'm especially hard on myself when I feel like I'm procrastinating. Um, and I feel like it's, you know, it's a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing because it's what pushes us to get better, but it's a bad thing if it puts you into a mental state that you kind of are constantly like self-defeatist and self-deprecating. So totally. have you found a way to balance where you can kind of push yourself to get better at things, but not do so in a way where it hurts your self-confidence? Yeah. I mean, a lot of it is just accepting, like trying to get rid of that internal conflict that goes on. Yeah. And I think part of what was helpful for me is kind of identifying where some of those orientations come from. You know, like my dad is is one of those people who's just like, he's like, go hard or go home. You know, like he, he moved to California at the early 40s and started running triathlons. Wow. And that's just how he is. Like he's intense and it's, and you know what? That's like, he, he obviously raised me that way and it taught me so much and it's such a valuable skill set, but not everywhere and all the time. Right. And I think up until maybe my thirties, maybe early thirties, I was intense all the time about everything. <laughs> so like when I had to exercise, like I might gain some weight. I'm like, I'm going to do P90X3 <laughs> and I'm going to go as hard. And I would do it by the way. And I would like, I could do 12 pull-ups when I was 30 and and then I would like lose it. And and that was like a lot of the coaching stuff I started doing was like, how do I make these things more sustainable, livable? And so I think just having that little lev like decision actually before I do something, because like up until maybe a few years ago, I would just go, okay, I want to, I want to read books. I, you got to read a book once a week. Like it would always be intense. And like, again, that worked well for me for a long time, but then it started to become less fun and less sustainable. 
And, and so I think for me, just noticing when I'm doing that, I'm going, you know, like a good example, actually. So exercise is a great example because up until COVID, I used to always exercise that way. And I was very on and off. And then I just, during COVID, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to like exercise a few days a week. I, I'm not going to make this, I want to make it a habit versus a goal. Um, yeah. this, there's a good article about that. And, and I have literally exercised for three years consistently for the first time in my life. Like I've exercised 20 times a month every and it's just because I'm not intense about it, actually. Totally. You, like, like, yeah, give yourself you, permission to miss certain days, and that doesn't miss a day. Who cares? Like, yeah, oh, yeah. the old the old version of Jesse is like, miss a day. Oh, dude, you have missed, oh, missed two days? All right, I'm done. I'm never working out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 100%. Um, the other funny one that actually just happened to me also uh, is, like, during COVID, I was like, oh, I should read. I should be reading. I, I had no job. Like, I was between things. And I just didn't feel like reading. And, you know, up until then, I was probably reading 20 books a year or something like that. And I just, I was like, damn. And, you, you know, it was the first time where instead of guilting myself, I was like, you know what? That's fine. I don't feel like reading. I don't know why. I had launched a bunch of companies. And funny enough, like in the last month, I've like read three books for the first time since since anything started. You read Die With Zero, uh, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just finished it. Um, and now I'm like, it's just fun. I'm like, oh, yeah, what what can I learn next? You know, and, and it's it's feeling a little bit more inspired than the drudgery of forcing myself to read books. So I don't know. A lot of it is trying to relate to my preferences and what I want and and doing it because I want it, truly want it versus I think I should want it or someone told me to do it or that's how I was raised. Yeah. Um, so that's the unpacking it for me. No, it makes total sense. I mean, I think I've talked about it on the podcast before, but the classic thing for me, and I think I've told you this, is like I I think because I'm a, a type seven on, on the Enneagram, like my classic thing is... I never feel like I'm spending my time perfectly. I feel like I procrastinate right. a lot. And by the way, this has been a feeling I've had since freshman year of college. Mm -hmm. And no matter what I do, I feel like I'm still not spending my time perfectly. Like you could do and, more. Exactly. And so it's this constant yeah. battle of me trying to push myself to be as effective and efficient with my time as possible. Because I also feel guilty with it sometimes, right? Like sometimes I feel guilty, like of all people... I should know how important the value of time is. And so when I don't spend my time intentionally in a given day, like I'm just not keeping my word to myself because I, I should understand the value. And so I think like sometimes it's helpful in making me better at spending my time because I really do think I can get better. But at other times, like I'm just like for the last 10 years, I have been so hard on myself about procrastinating. How do I no. do so in a way where like, it doesn't hurt, hurt my self-confidence, confidence, but it allows me to get better. Yeah, one of the funny things my coach will do, and I'm like, man, I had a rough week, and God, I, I screwed this up, and I should have done this better, and I could have gotten so much more out of this. He'll like, so tell me, like, where'd you start in the week? Where'd you end? Like, we'll go through kind of all the stuff I got done. He's like, damn, you, like, got a lot done this week, Jesse. Totally. <laughs> He'll just be like, you sounds like a pretty good week, you know? <laughs> like, what... And I think we make things a problem oftentimes that aren't, or even just starting in that place of there's a problem here. Yep. Um, it, it, versus he does this thing. He literally goes like, there's no problems. Now, what do you want? What do you want to do? Yeah. And that's like, a if you just say that, like, no, there's nothing wrong. No, there's no problems. Because usually we start with, oh, there's a problem. There's something wrong. And it's almost like, okay, we're trained to think that way to kind of like to be better instead of just kind of going like, nothing's wrong. Just Let's just go do some stuff. I love that. Um, but anyway, to answer your real question, you know, we... Adrian has been in the Philippines um, and she's been there for two weeks and, you know, we have 300 people there and she's been meeting with them. And, and she's, she's and, the CEO of Growth Assistant, right? Growth Assistant, yeah, which is yeah. the, you know, talent, digital marketing talent uh, marketplace where we find brands and agencies uh, marketing talent in the Philippines and, and soon other countries one day. Um, but she's been there and, and I think it's been just amazing for her. You know, she's worked, our internal staff there is about 25 and we have like 300 GAs working for clients. And, you know, I think it, it all became really real for her and I think it was really amazing. So anyway, that's what she's been up to while she's been away, you know, she's on the other side of the world and got a ton going on. So I've been kind of like running her staff meetings, the one we were talking about in the last episode. Um, in addition to running Kahani, like it's, it's been a lot, I've had a lot on my plate yeah. And it's been good, you know, and I think one of the things that's interesting is even once you get to about five or six people, we did actually with my coach last week, we did a values exercise for Kahani. Uh, we just tried to identify three values that everybody shared and thought were important. It was super powerful. What were they? Um, they were, uh, I can tell you, they were move fast and learn things. They were proactive honesty. Um, and they were uh, act like an owner. And so, and it was actually cool. He, he used a Netflix example. We could probably put it in the show notes. Like 
what you know at the end of the day you can have single words right ownership communication yep um and uh, proactivity or, proact- uh, or or no can well it's like can- candor communication was one of them um ownership was one of them and then like speed uh, speed or learning yep. speed slash learning but what netflix does which I, which I love and we did the same thing as a group and it was a really good exercise is we then listed like three to four behaviors of what that actually means yep because the value like values have taken on such a you know and, and so we did a couple of interesting ones we only pick we said let's do two or three Let's actually make sure we're living these things. And even when a company is five, six, seven people, I think that's kind of the right time to start the values conversation because it sort of gives people a guideline. It's leverage for the founders to kind of give them a guidepost for what people will do when they're not around. And it's like, also when you have the most them? control over this stuff. Like when you have 500 people actually changing from where you were in the early days is very difficult. Very, very hard. Yeah. 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 And every, every company, I believe every company has values, whether stated or unstated or whether lived yeah. or unlived right like it's whatever people get paid promoted hired fired based on like it's how those decisions are made and so that was a really great exercise and you could already feel the next day i was like okay we're gonna move fast like we're gonna and just calling it out and being able to use it as a touchstone so that was interesting the other thing i they just picked up on is is this is a big one um you know there's just this a lot of folks who join companies even early stage there tends to be there's the people who either you know they ask for forgiveness or they ask for permission and I've been kind of going around and kind of going like, hey, stop asking for permission. Yeah. You know, part of that's acting like an owner, right? That's like a cool way of thinking about ownership. It's like, if you actually own the business, what would you do? You wouldn't be waiting around, to, you know, to act. Uh, like, there's this question of both companies. Like, oh, should we should we welcome new customers? Should we say publicly they become customers? I'm like, yeah, sure. Like, if they don't like it, they'll tell us, you know. And, <laughs> just do and, it, see and, what happens. Yeah, just do it, see what happens. But it's it's, you realize actually how much organizational uh inertia and slowness sets in because of that one issue which is like i'm gonna wait for permission and not ask for forgiveness right and it's always good back to the earlier part of our conversations like people don't want to get in trouble like they don't want to do something wrong they don't want to make a mistake and that's been a big one for me is just like on the margin just kind of playing a lot with mindsets and saying like let's let's move to this forgiveness mindset yeah we Um, we i feel like in uh there's always different words for it but in the early days of the brew We'd always, I always thought of it as like there's two types of employees. There's pull employees and there's push employees. Pull mm-hmm. employees are the people that pull the entire business forward. Push employees are the people you have to push as in like give them orders and they're order takers and they do the thing. And I do think dep- as you get to a certain size, push employees aren't necessarily a bad thing. But in the early days of the business, having pull employees is really, really important. It's funny you mentioned the... Uh, like ownership mentality, people acting like owners. Because Austin and I talked about this ad nauseum throughout building the brew. Do you think people actually have to be owners in order to act like owners? As in, do you think everyone has to have equity to to have that value in place? No, I don't think so. I, I think I'm kind of more in the 37 signals camp around equity ownership. Like just because you give someone 0.1 for 5%, you know, a company's worth a hundred million dollars and it sells for a hundred million and someone gets 0.15% of that company, they're going to get what, 150 grand. Yeah. And that's not, that's not small money. I'm not saying it's small, but it's also not like it shouldn't, you know, it shouldn't change every waking hour of their life to work as hard as so the founder who might get to own 20 or 30% of the business in yeah, that situation. There's actually, right? there's actually an argument to be made that like just paying them higher comp for a period of five totally. years is a better option for them. Totally. I'm generally more in that camp, I'd say, based on my experience. Um, but dude, people want to own stuff because because that's like a great way. Like it's a fun way to be. Yeah. Right. It's 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 nice to feel purpose. It's nice to feel like you care about something. Um, you know, it's a sort of the Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance, right? Like it's that's I think that's an enjoyable way to live versus someone who kind of doesn't care. Yep. Uh, and you know, my now my favorite analogy for the ownership one is just the rental car versus own a car, right? Like when you when you own a car, you're gonna Drive a little more carefully. You're going to look at the cars next to that you're parking. When you're renting a car, you do not give, you know, you don't give two hoots usually about what happens to the car as long as you don't have to pay anything. And so, but no, I, I don't think you have to own part of the company. And I think that's like a faux narrative oftentimes um, that founder, you know, founders will somewhat be manipulative around, oh, everyone's an owner here. And it's like, yeah, you know, maybe. Totally. Right? Also, one, uh, one other question about just as you've taken over the staff meetings while Adrian's been in the Philippines. Have you taken time to just think about, do you enjoy doing this? Like, has this brought awareness of like things you 
do you want to do moving forward versus don't want to do like what what was your feeling around taking these over when you this isn't part of your you know week to week work anymore yeah I, you know i i think i'm i'm more long term more excited to be in the seat of the person coaching that person and yep. helping them learn those skills and build them um and i'm probably a little less excited about being the person running that meeting actually uh, with that said, like, you know, I, I think I was like, oh, I should probably do this every six months for any business I'm in, you know, and like some of it might be like the principal sitting in on the teachers thing, because I don't even usually sit in on her meetings, you know, and it's just good. Like, like I, I think people, people got to see a different style and a different flavor, you know, um, I tend to be a little bit more intense probably than she is. And like, there was some feedback that someone said to her. She's like, yeah, it was, it was meetings a little different when Jesse was running. <laughs> like, there's a lot of healthy pressure, and and I think the other thing for her was I think she found it valuable. We recorded them, and she was like, oh yeah, like that's a stylistic thing I didn't realize. Yeah, you know, and her and I, her and I are extremely close friends, and so we have a ton of candor. And like, you know, one of the things we both just talked about was like, there's that moment where someone says something, and it's not the complete answer, or it's they're a little off base, or it's just it like leaves something to be desired in terms of like how buttoned up they are or how well they understand something in, in a staff meeting. Right. And she's, you know, she's two years into being a CEO and she's like, she's like, I'll have the same thought that I know you had Jesse, but I'm like, oh, I don't know if I want to bother, you know, like, like she won't want necessarily want to press and I'm not, I'm not mean about it, but I will go, wait, hold on. The numbers you said just don't add up for me. Yeah. Right. Or wait, but what does that company actually do? Right. Like what, what's their, what's their business? Why do we think it's an opportunity? So I think the one of the learnings when she got watching me was like, oh, like the, uh, she has the same thoughts, which is really good, right? She's like, I, I, I definitely conclude the same things as you, but I just like you're willing to just keep pushing on it until there's clarity or until there's like a real obvious next step. And I think that was great for her to see that and then know that like people actually like it too, you know, if, if they feel like it, as long as you're not being mean about it, they go, oh, okay, yeah, that's good. We got an answer to that and we're going to move forward with it. And it sets it, the tone, by the way, when you do that every week. <clears throat> and with, with, I guarantee you when she comes back, people are going to just be more on top of their stuff. Totally. There's I, this, I, mean, uh, it, I just want to say one thing on that. It's, I think in some ways, the way you describe it, like I'm more like Adrian and I want to get to more like your side of the spectrum or at least like learn from it because I don't know if this is how Adrian feels, but the way that you just described how like you handle meetings differently than she does is it just seems like what people would describe as let's call it like tension or confrontation mm -hmm. you welcome that more whereas like i i personally am afraid of it i'll i'll just even use the most meta example like today right before this episode when we did a little bit of a change or run a show i felt nervousness around messaging you saying hey right. can you let me know more in advance about a topic for the show like i actually felt like oh am i being a dick here like yeah, like yeah, it was yeah. very uncomfortable to me but actually in doing that it i was a little bit as ridiculous as it sounds proud of myself because like those types of conversations are very uncomfortable for me but to your point it is so important because when you aren't willing to like drill down to what do we actually need to do why wasn't something done this way it it you don't have as much precision around the direction that people are going. Totally. And and I think like, I mean, you tell me about radical candor, which is you care a lot and you're very honest. Yeah. yeah. And I think like, I'm not, by the way, like I'm not even in a, in the span of one meeting, I may go from like being really, really loving, but very tough to then like kind of on the line to then kind of being a jerk. And and like, I, I, I like part of my self-awareness been like, I'll catch myself and go, hold on guys. I'm not saying that yeah. you didn't do anything wrong or, you know, I'll have to be very specific. And and it's super important that we don't just leave this unanswered, right? Totally. Otherwise, here's what happened. And then everyone goes, yeah, yeah, you're right, Jesse. Totally get it. Versus the old me would have just been like, come on, guys. Like, what are we doing here? You're like, this is craziness, right? Totally. And, and so I think that's, anyway, yeah. I, I, think that's the, I think that's where all the good juice is, which is like, and also just in your mind, getting rid of that tension. I was, I was telling someone the other day, like in one of the big things that's different for Gateway X versus Ampush for me is I've gotten a lot better at firing people. And I don't mean like, I'm like Ari Gold, who's just like, I love firing people. I hate, you know. You're not walking out with a paintball gun around your office. No. And, but the reason is because I actually don't judge those people anymore. And I don't try to like make them right or wrong. I just realize they're not working with me. Like the fit's not right. Yeah. And so in a, in a pretty loving way, usually, and in a helpful way, I'm like, hey, like this isn't really working. Here's some of the things we could do to be doing it differently. I'm going to give that a shot. And you know, if it works, it works. If it does like. But I, the old me would be like, why can't you figure this? You know, like it would be a much more judgy 
thing. And then I would actually get nervous the same way you would. Like, I don't want to have that confrontational totally. conversation. Right. I don't want to, I don't want to get, and then I would just leave it alone. And then I would like be bad at firing someone or I just keep hoping that they were going to turn. And this time I've just gotten like, oh yeah, if you, if you consistently don't show up to a meeting prepared, like I, I'm not going to judge you for it. Right. Like, but that just doesn't work for me. Like, yeah. And totally. that's it. And and so that has made me much better at it. And I think even like, because it's not, it doesn't have to be, it's not, the, there's no more trade-off between being nice and standing up for my standards. There's it's just both. They're both at the same time. I am nice or kind while also upholding my standards. And like, I'm not perfect at it by any means, but that's like the thing I work on a lot. A hundred percent. And just one last thought around this topic of like tension and um, confrontation is I think as I become more aware, self-aware of like why I avoid confrontation, ironically, what I've realized over time is it actually is totally for, or not totally, but a lot of for selfish reasons. Like I used 100%. to, right? Like I used to think it was because I didn't want to upset people because I was empathic to people's feelings. Maybe totally. there's a little piece of that, but really what it is, is I don't want to hurt people's feelings because I don't want people to dislike me and I have a fear of being disliked. Yeah. And I think when you have kids or you know, you have siblings, it's like if your sibling or your kid was walking with a booger on their face, <laughs> like, is it loving to not tell them they have a booger on their face? Yeah, of obviously course not. not. You come up yeah. to them and you, you know, if your dad, like me, you'd lick your, t- your thumb and you'd wipe the, yeah. the booger off or wash it and then wash yeah. it or whatever. Because you wouldn't want that for someone you care about, right? And and so I, I agree with you 100%. You wouldn't say like, oh, am I going to be mean by it? Like, and so there is, I mean, it's a fine line and that's kind of one of the challenges. Around. One other thing I'll just, uh, we can end with this on is, you know, as I've seen great organizations operate, like the Red Ventures guys and McKinsey and Facebook and some of these things, like it, I read this about Apple and Apple's really strange because it's a functionally organized company. It's a massively functionally organized company, which is very strange, right? Typically a company that big, has the iPod division and the yep. iPhone division, and they don't. And right, versus companies. having like their engineering group, their it's sales one engineering group. Yeah, yeah. Group. yeah. And there's this really good HBS article on their culture. And what's funny about it is even though they're organized that way, and like you know, Amazon famously has all these tiny little teams. The sub, the sort of sub values underneath it, according to this article, are the same as like Red Ventures, Amazon, any of these other companies. And my favorite one that I tell like Adrian, new leaders is. Apple requires that you know the details of your organization three levels down. So if you're a VP, and and the reason they do that is just a very like this is part of just why it's important to be super buttoned up or know the answers or know know your numbers and your data, is because they don't ever want people to say I have to follow up to make a yeah. decision. They walk into a meeting and they're like, so like how many units are being produced for da da da? And the VP's in the meeting. And the VP has to know the answer to that question, right? Totally. And the second you say it that way, you're like, of course, that makes perfect sense. And so even in small companies like we are, I'm like, guys, like know, you know, know your numbers, three levels. Like you gotta know the, the innards of your numbers. And that's just an important part of of performing in a high way. I love that. That's really good. Okay. So we've talked a little bit about what's going on in your world. Now I want to share what's going on in my world, but in some ways I just want this to be uh, founder therapy for a second. So <laughs> as, as we know, I've been working on uh, the plunge and in doing so, I think I've realized a few things just about getting back into the early stage of businesses. Cause again, I haven't been in like the really early days of a business in eight years. The first thing that I've realized is there is like a true, really significant cost to being scrappy. And I've always been someone who like embraces this identity of being like, I'm so scrappy. Like I have one setting and I'm just going to will something into existence. Like I love that about myself. And generally, like I think it's also the bootstrapper mentality. Like you have to be scrappy because you don't have a lot of Mm -hmm. resources. But what I've realized is while scrappiness can be a really good thing for – there are some positives. Like you develop a lot of the skills that you end up hiring people into. Uh, you uh, stretch a dollar really far because you're not paying for a lot of shit. On the right. the other There's side creativity of it, too, right? Creativity comes exa- from it. Because- exactly. You have a lot of boundaries, so it forces you to be creative and think of novel ideas. The, the trade-off is, first of all – like I think scrappiness can lead to frugality and frugality truly like 
isn't necessarily a good thing. Like when I think back to one of the big transitions that Austin and I had to make with Morning Brew, it was the fact that we were bootstrap founders. And as we were starting to cash flow millions of dollars in the business, we didn't have the skill of how to allocate all of that money because we had never right. dealt with that much money in our lives. But the other reason to me, like scrappiness can be a hindrance um, in the business is like, I think I am avoiding spending money on things right now because it feels good to not spend money on things. So like I'm doing all of the things right now. Like I'm uh, running the social accounts. I'm running the Facebook ad campaign. I'm creating the creative. I read a copywriting book to, to, to write the copy for right, the ads. Right. I messaged you yesterday being like, I took three or four hours to set up a Facebook advertising campaign. And there's... I love the fact that I'm learning these skills because I also do think these are some valuable skills for starting yeah. businesses. But part of me is like, one, am I decreasing the odds of this business succeeding versus just delegating this to someone who does social and paid marketing for a living? And this is all the time they focus on is get driving great performance on ads. And two, what else could I be doing with this time? Like, could I be thinking about another business spin up or spend time on making sure the product is exceptional. So like, how do you think about- It sounds like you're doing that thing to yourself that you were just talking about. What? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're beating exactly. yourself up about how you're using your time. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it. I, I, no, I totally- it's fine. I, I totally am. But okay, but at least just for me to have a reference point, in any of your businesses, like whether it was when you were starting uh, uh, Growth Assistant, when you were starting Kahani, when you were starting Unbloat, how did you decide what you did versus what you like paid other people to do? Yeah, I, I'm like kind of lazy and and not really a doer. Uh, I certainly not anymore because I'm old. I'm an old man. Um, and so classic, you know, classic thirty something year old calling themselves an old person. Yeah, I know. Um, but but I I think that I am actually very good at holding people accountable and sort of like keeping pace with things and ensuring things are getting done in a certain way. And so in general, I oriented, I orient towards that. And so I'd say for probably for all the businesses, you know, there's certain times I wrote sales emails, copies, I run sales meetings, you know, for Kahani, it's still very, very diligently. I've been doing working on product stuff and specking certain things out. Um, but like the Facebook stuff, like it is some of it is is like where is my genius going to add value to this? I, I think that's probably the best, biggest question I ask, and and like is that is it going to be worthwhile my time? Now, it's funny because Carolyn, who runs Un Unco the Unbloat the supplement business that we have, you know she we had an agency running the Facebook stuff and and a bunch of contractors. She came in and started running the business, and it was just I actually was like I think you need to run it, and and in this why case did, it was why a did different. you why did you make that decision? Yeah, because she didn't kind of like the Apple thing, like she she wasn't able to move fast enough to make the decisions she needed to because she didn't understand the levers that you could and couldn't pull. Yeah. And it was like everything came through translation, right? It was like everything it was the languages in Russian and everything had to get translated to English and then she had to retranslate it back to Russian and then the things would happen. And she's really bright and very active. And, and I was like, you know, I just, and I said, not forever, of course. Right. But I think for three to six months, you running this uh, and, and she took it over and, and within a month it had improved. And now it's, it's like firing, you know, it's going really well because, because, you know, the, the space between her brain, the ideas and her brain and the data is zero essentially. Yeah. Right now, would I do that? Probably not, because I've been running Facebook campaigns for twelve years, and like I don't need that extra. Like I speak Russian, right? In this analogy, and so I can just read the Russian text directly and, totally. and interpret and go, wait, why, why are we doing that? That's that doesn't seem to make a lot. You're of sense basically to saying me. you know the thing well enough to hold others accountable to it because you can ask the right questions about it. Yeah, I think that's right, and and the, and my genius around it is not like it, it, I'm not going to add a ton of, of significant value. I mean, this obviously comes up a lot with engineering. Yeah. And, and dev and tech. And I think like the, it, if I could go back and do it all over again, I would have learned to code, you know, or some, but early on, I don't, I don't know how to. And so it's always been a bit of a hamstring issue for me. Now, the one way I've, I've solved it is like find really good people. And again, can you manage them closely? Like have a conversation and say, well, this is what we want to build. Like, is it, you know, how long is it going to take you? And oh, they'll take me two weeks. And then does it take them two weeks or not? And can you start to iterate? And then you can also learn and ask questions, right? And I think that's a big thing for me is like, so what what was what took you a long time on this? What didn't take you a long time? What's the 
you know, and, and that's especially important with engineering because you may say something that you think is easy to do, but if you don't break it down a couple of levels, they may interpret that as like, that could be a three month project. Totally. Right. And, and sometimes I'll say something and then they'll go, well, that'll be really hard. I go, well, what's hard about it? And I'll, they'll say it and I'll go, oh no, I didn't mean to do it in that level of depth. I just meant this. And they go, oh, that, that's a week, Jesse. And so some of it is again, like uh, maybe another thing is having the conversation about the how of the work. Uh, being a big part of it. So I would ask you less about the money and the scrappiness and more the like, why is it important for you to do those things? And there may be a good reason. Maybe like, Jesse, I don't, it's been a long time since I've done Facebook ads or I've never, copywriting I've ne- is not something I'm... Be- I've never run a Facebook ad myself. When we were doing it in the early days at The Brew, we had high... Austin started by doing it. That was part of the work he took over. And right. then we hired someone in to do that. So this is actually the first time ever that I've set up a Facebook ad campaign. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's probably value in that, right? Yeah, totally. I mean, and and probably in a lot of things, but I I do think that lens is important. And then I think the other big one is like graduating yourself and the organization quickly past that. Yeah. The other thing I see founders do is like you and I talk in a year and you're like, yeah, man, and I'm running the Facebook campaign. I'm like, what are you doing? (laughs) Totally. um, So I think that's, that's the other big issue with it is like, I do see a lot of founders myself. I do this too. Sometimes it's like very binary. Yep. Like I'm either in something and I'm in it all the way or I just fly right above the surface and kind of like it, whether it's good or bad, it kind of just happens. Totally. So that's the big thing that I'm I'm actively thinking about. And I think to your point, like I want to get to a place where I understand this well enough and the business is chugging along, chugging along enough such that I can hire someone to do it. The second thing that I've realized is, you know, I've always told the narrative to people that I'm a, like I'm this really level headed guy and I really don't. Uh, emote a lot and it's such a valuable thing in business because I, I, I don't get rattled. It, I don't rattle other people around me um, and I can kind of go through the roller coaster without feeling it. I think part of that's a lie. Um, and the reason I think it's a lie is like now that I'm back in the early days of building something, I'm feeling every bump of the roller coaster. Like, uh, you know, just using the plunge as an example, I felt the fact that this first Facebook ad campaign like didn't do very well. It, it was like a $6 CPL. CPL, we were just trying to drive emails. It's like really fucking expensive. I didn't feel good about it. I didn't feel good when I took the game down to Austin. I played it at South by with people and mm-hmm. no one was like, everyone was trying. No one was hitting the plunger to the board when they were throwing it. And I'm like, shit, is this too hard for people? Like people right. are going to, people are like not going to get early wins. And so they're going to get unexcited by the game. Like, what do we do? Like, I really felt a pit in my stomach around that. Then a day later, when I saw an Instagram influencer with 40 million followers created a video using the game, I felt like I was on top of the world. So I think right. I've had like this, this fallacy that like I don't feel things. I just think I, as I was getting further and further away from like the product and like the ground level of building the business, I just wasn't close enough it to to really feel it. Yeah, and I think like I think the you know this happened with me early on. It was like. Type sevens, by the way, you know, we hate bad news. Like oh, we yeah. hate negativity. Yeah. And so like, well, this is a funny example. One of the things that coaching do, they do is like anything you do in your head, they try to get it out of your head and try to make it really big so that you become more aware of, of, of it. And so I had a period where Dave was like, anytime you see a number on a report, because I would sometimes avoid looking at reports because I was like, I don't want to look at those numbers, you know, like they're scary. They're going to be bad. I know they're going to be bad. <laughs> right. And he'd go, every time you see a bad number, like you feel fear. I'm like, yeah. And I feel like and I go down this kind of, he goes, I want you to look at it, scream at the top of your lungs and run out of the room because you're afraid of the number. And I actually yeah. did it. I, like, and obviously you was do anyone it like else five there? or six. <laughs> no, I mean, well, my wife was a couple of times. She's like, what the hell are you doing? And, and, but I did it a few times and it really, it, it really hit it home that like, I do feel scared. And so yeah. it's like, ah, scary and then the more you like actually feel it the easier you actually rebound in my experience at least you, you rebound much faster totally um, and it's so helpful so you try that it, like like when you're feeling the ha- happiness and the sadness like uh, the happiness is like be like like celebrate it scream positively at the top of your lungs and then when you're feeling the like nervousness like try to make the sounds and be like oh my god this is oh, what, what if my next thing fails what if i'm a one one hit wonder like all those things that pop in your mind because that's what happens right you go from a $6 CPL mentally to oh, yeah. <laughs> what if I'm a one hit wonder? A hundred percent. And that the speed of that story that goes from like this little innocent thing to it is the greatest gravity of like your identity is untrue to you. It, it's crazy. Totally. I love yeah. that. Or even okay. just saying it like I'm afraid. I, I feel scared. Like I find that to be really 
because these things actually release it usually and then you can come back and like okay cool like, yeah because because well, you, you know you will go figure it out i i started up uh the new uh ad campaign uh this morning uh so hopefully it does do well but if it doesn't uh i will scream in my office to myself and uh rambo uh, when it doesn't do well. Um, okay, we're going to pop into the final part of this episode on my experience at South by Southwest and how actually the events business can be pretty crazy and pretty lucrative despite being unsexy. Yeah. So uh, let's just hear from our partners, the ones that pay the bills, and then we'll come back. Let's be real. Business owners can't do everything. There are just too many fires to put out on the daily from managing benefits coverage for employees to navigating intricate payrolls to dealing with compliance penalties. But to level up your biz, you're going to need the confidence to handle all of these challenges. Here's a pro tip. Don't do it alone. ADP's PEO, ADP Total Source, is here to help. As a leading PEO, ADP has seen it all, from helping businesses handle tricky employee situations to managing turnover and compensation. And with up to 53% of small businesses getting sued by their employees every year, ADP Total Source stands with you. They back you with their EPLI policy, and they're the only PEO that stands behind their advice with a legal defense benefit. Terms and conditions apply, but this is a big deal. And the cherry on top? Research has shown that businesses that partner with a PEO grow 7 to 9% faster. It's a no-brainer. Partner up with ADP Total Source. Want to see if your business is a good fit for a PEO? Go to adp.com slash the crazy ones to find out. That's adp.com slash the crazy ones. Ah, spring, the perfect time to refresh your wardrobe, your apartment, and that's right, your email marketing. Don't have time to analyze all those data points about performance or spend months researching new content strategies. MailChimp helps take the guesswork out of your marketing strategy. Unlike other platforms that just report on how your emails are performing, MailChimp analyzes real data from billions of emails that they send to provide personalized, industry-specific guidance. These data-backed recommendations can help improve your email content, subject lines, audience targeting, and so much more. Stop guessing about your audience and start targeting future customers with MailChimp's informative, personalized, and data back recommendations. Get started today at MailChimp.com slash guesswork. That's MailChimp.com slash guesswork. MailChimp sponsored this segment of the podcast. MailChimp is not affiliated with any other products, brands, or companies featured or mentioned on the podcast. This episode of The Crazy Ones is brought to you by Electric. One thing all business leaders know for sure, security is paramount. To grow with confidence and create your best work, you need to trust your work will stay protected and supported. And Electric is your go-to for IT needs big, small, and somewhere in between. Access proactive security standardization across devices, apps, and networks, and rest easy knowing you have lightning fast IT support at your service. But that's not all. If you complete a qualified meeting with Electric, they will send you a free pair of AirPods Pro. To qualify, you must be an IT decision maker at a US based company with 10 to 500 employees. Get started at electric.ai slash crazy ones. That's electric.ai slash crazy ones. Okay, and we are back. Um, so for context listeners, um, when you're, as of the publishing of this episode, when you're listening to it, it's been a few weeks since I went to South by Southwest, but as of recording, I got back from Austin, Texas three days ago, and I'll just quickly talk about my experience in Austin. First of all, Austin's a great city. If my family lived there, I would absolutely consider living in Austin. That said, I think it's the best time to hook me right now. I've heard the summers are absolutely brutal. Few interesting observations from South by. The first observation is like, if you didn't realize that a recessionary environment was going on, like markets down, fundings dried up, companies laying people off, <laughs> you would you would think that like we are in like the greatest bull run of all time. Like the energy and how many people were in Austin was crazy to me. And honestly, it had me thinking the whole time that I was there, like, should most of these people be at like <laughs> at, at South by? Like, it's kind of crazy to me. Like, so many startups are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions, on like these huge activations. 
I, I actually, Jesse, I'm just curious about this for a sec. Like, what's your view on when it makes sense for uh, a CEO to actually go to conferences? Like, it just feels like it was a waste of time for most of the people there. Yeah, I mean, maybe not surprisingly, I, I if you if I want to go to a conference, we're going to Shop Talk, uh, you know, and where's like, that Vegas? That's that's in Vegas, and after after spring break with the kids, we're going. Like, I'm going with one one other team member, and like before we even got to the point where I was like, okay, it's going to cost X. I was like, what's our goals? Like, what you know, what would make it a high, very high ROI event? Because conferences do have the benefit of like, man, you can meet a lot of people in a short period of time if that's what you're out there doing. And if you're a VC and you're trying to invest in companies, that kind of makes sense, right? If you're in Shop Talk, it's like there's going to be tons of e-commerce and CMO people there. And to me, you have to hold it to a goal. So it's like, you know, I forgot exactly what ours is. I think it's 25 meetings that come from that uh, in addition to like we show Kahani on our phones to like 50 people or something like that, yep. right? So it's like, so so yeah, I mean, look, I, I think they can be valuable um, if they have ROI and goals attached to them. And I think separately, like if it's, there's a big thing in this ecosystem that we all just love it. Like the reason people are on Twitter, the reason you and I do this show is because we're all passionate about entrepreneurship. And I think there that's a reasonable reason, but then you should just be honest with yourself and whoever else, which is like, yeah, I'm going there for a few days to see my friends and like learn stuff and hang out. Like, yeah, it's so you're talking not, about a vacation, not work. <laughs> under, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I, I wouldn't argue that. Um, it's not there to work. It's there because it's good to be in, you know, you enjoy it and, yeah, and totally. you, you value that time. Um, and do you think you couldn't get that 25 meetings just being home and reaching out to people and scheduling them digitally? I don't think you'd be able to get the, them in the same way, both like the velocity, like, you, you know, there's literally several thousand e-commerce leaders in one place at one time. Yep. And so I think that's incredibly valuable. And then... And then, you know, like if in my case, for example, like I'm, I'm pretty, you know, well-spoken and, and like when I'm in person with people, it tends to be a little bit more impactful. And so it hopefully not only improves the, the fact that we'll get the meetings, but also the quality of the, of that interaction versus a zoom. It's like very, very different. Totally. Yeah. I, I think that makes sense. Maybe the, uh, maybe the, the real hack is you post on Twitter or LinkedIn that you're going to South by you're going to shop talk and you say, if you want to meet up, let me know. People respond saying, uh, hey, let's meet up. I'll be there. And then the day before you say your flight got canceled, you'd still love to chat, though. And you set up uh, dozens of meetings just virtually after your flight got canceled. No, I think um, I think conferences can be valuable. I just think a lot of people go there for vacation calling it work or a lot of people don't have the type of discussion you were just talking about with your team member where you actually lay out like what are our very specific metrics that would make this conference a win. And even for the people who do that, I think a lot of people also stay within their comfort zone where like, yes, they say like, let's show Kahani to 50 people. And then they go to the event. They're like kind of scared. Like it is going to events and like forcing yourself into conversation with people is highly uncomfortable. And I just right. think a lot, a lot of people will avoid those types of conversations. If you're able to do the things that we just talked about, then I think it can be worth it. No. Yeah. Um, I mean, these so, conferences make a lot of money too. I think that's part of one of the, for the organizers, right? Cause they bring oh, these people together. Yeah. It's insane. And we'll talk about it in a second. Uh, you know, the only other thought from South by is I'm just trying to reflect on some of my uh, most interesting experiences there. The first is I saw Terry Crews. Uh, he was there's there's some uh, movie or show where I think he's like the president. His name's Camacho, and he was on the back of a pickup truck with a blonde wig. Guys jacked out of his mind, wearing a tank top and spandex. So I saw him driving down uh, uh, Congress, the main street in South yeah. by. That was interesting. Um, and then I I will say it was not. As a non-operator right now, it was nice to meet people that I have met on Twitter over the last six years, but I've never met in person. So I met like Sam Parr, who I've never met in person. I met Nick Gray, who I've never met in person. Shout out Nick Gray, who he was doing free Tesla rides from, uh, he'd pick people up from the airport for free and drive them to their destination. I got to meet him. He had a little sign that said the plunge. Why was he doing went, that? Just as a way to like meet founders. Um, huh. and and I think also he knew he was going to take picture with these people. These pic people have audience on Twitter and he would put his right. book, which is um, the two hour cocktail party. He would put a picture of that in each Twitter picture that ended up getting posted. So that, so that was smart. What was the most uh, interesting thing you learned or like most uh, interesting conversation you had? 
Um, the most interesting conversation that I had is probably at this dinner. Like it was probably at this small dinner that I had with Sam Parr. Um, uh, a biz, uh, Sam Parr, the guys who started Our Future, that Morning Brew acquired. And then there were some other really cool entrepreneurs there. There's a guy who started a chicken coop business. They're creating like a electric chicken coop business. Um, I think, honestly, like the most interesting thing uh, I learned from Sam, like it kind of just goes into the topic we're about to talk about. So this is probably a good pivot, which is, you know, the hustle started as an events business. And like it started as a single tech event for early stage founders in San Francisco. And then they just used that list of attendees. And that's what started the hustle newsletter. And it just had me thinking about like, there are just all these different, I would say, relatively low risk ways as an entrepreneur to to build quality audience that you can then monetize in a lot of ways. Obviously, like newsletter and Twitter is a great way to do it. But events are also an exceptional way to do it. And so like as I was at South by, I was just thinking the whole time, like there are hundreds of thousands of people here. How big of an event is it? And they don't publish the financials publicly about the event. But it came out that at in 2017, South by Southwest drove $325 million in economic impact to Austin. $165 million of that was all around attendance was ticket holders, credentials, et cetera. And then you had another like 38 million that was for exhibitors and sponsors. But it actually, when I think about it, I think events are actually such a good way for first time entrepreneurs or just entrepreneurs who want to build a great cash flowing business to get into the thing because you can do a pretty low risk, right? You can uh, sell sponsorships up front. You can pre-sell tickets. You can use that to pay for the venue and things. And basically, if you niche it down enough, you know you're going to get a highly valuable audience. And so I started going down this rabbit hole of just like events businesses. And there's some crazy events businesses. Like there's a company um, called Informa. Have you heard of Informa? Mm -mm. Informa is a $12 billion UK-based business. Uh, Just their events business did $395 million top line in 2022. And by the way, events businesses can be 30 to 50% margin businesses. Like, yeah, like they're super they're, profitable. They're, they're super profitable. There's another one called Essential. This is the business that owns uh, Can Lion and Money 2020. They did $375 million in 2017. Like these events can do like yeah, Can Lion. Huge ones. I mean, the there's this, this Indian couple, somebody was telling me about them and, and they... They become they become like the master. They started Shop Talk, and not only oh, did oh, they, they start Money Twenty Twenty also. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. they basically just have have it down to a formula, and they build them, they get attendance, and then they fl- and then they sell them. And totally. and like I mean, you could just do the back of the envelope math. If you and I wanted to throw a, a conference of some sort, yep. you know, if you can just ballpark numbers, you could have a thousand people attend. On average, charge them a thousand bucks. That's a million bucks. Yep. Right. And then if you can, if you get the right types of people, people are ready to spend money and whatever, you could probably get another, I've heard anywhere from 50 to 100% of your attendance costs in, in sponsorships. Yep. And that, you know, you have the, the lanyard sponsor and the book, what a bag sponsor and the big, you know, the, um, and so you can make $2 million for a thousand people attending and the, you know, the hotel venues are not that expensive. There's like, maybe that would require you one full-time person and staff and then, probably several hundred thousand dollars just to kind of have the venue space and all the food and whatever other things are there. So like that, I mean, that's probably, I'm probably forgetting some big expenses. There's marketing expenses, there's all the logistics, whatever. But to your point, it's not that hard to imagine. Say you did 1.5 million. It's not that hard to imagine that you could be having 40, 50% margins. That's what I've heard. And then there's all these other smart things like shop talk, for example, will try to sell you meetings Totally. And they'll say, like, we actually will organize them. And for $500 a meeting, <laughs> you can get in the room with a person. And and so anyway, I mean, yeah, I think there are even at the big level examples are amazing. But the even at a small level, you can build a pretty good business there that gets going. Not the other cool thing, by the way, is I don't do you know Jay Weintraub? No. He's like one of my first friends in starting businesses. He's like the guy who started LeedsCon. Okay. The other the other cool thing is like you end up becoming the person who knows everyone in that little 
industry or niche. Totally. And that's incredibly valuable, right? Like you just become a power broker of sorts. And and I think like that can become another uh, uh, I'm su- benefit. By the way, I'm surprised why you haven't launched a growth marketing event. Like why you don't do a growth marketing conference. You know everyone in the space. It helps you actually potentially find great operators for future businesses that you launch. At, like to me, it feels like a no brainer. Like you just find someone who'd be great at putting together an event. You could do it so easily. Yeah, no, it's it's. I've had I have a couple different events in mind. I have this. I heard about this one that Dan Gilbert throws called Detroit Homecoming. Okay. And obviously, I wanted to throw like STL Homecoming. And the idea behind it is like all these cities have like amazing alums, if you will, like yep. people who grew up here, and and like he basically attracts them all back to Detroit, gets city leaders in the room, and like has a conversation about like how to improve the city and so on. And there's so many like baller St. Louis uh alums right totally uh, like in, in every walk of life like jack dorsey's one you know john doerr is one yep. uh the cfo of facebook is one um in addition to like jason tatum <laughs> like, like there's there's an interesting totally. group right and you, you and they all and most people who grew up here have a pretty strong affection for it and so i don't know if you, i'd make money on that one but that's one that i've always wanted to do I, I love that and by the way just back to money 2020 for a second just to give people a sense of numbers that that conference, at least pre-pandemic, was doing $40 million a year, and it was acquired by Essential, the business that owns Can Lion, for $100 million bucks. And the, you know, the really amazing thing about these businesses is not only can they be super high margin, but they really are like an annuity in some sense. Like these businesses just cash flow year in, year out. And uh, you can almost, if you put together the right uh, event in the right niche where people are true, like it truly is bringing in business for people. You can think about it like a software business where like every year you are just going to get your ticket sponsorship, your, your ticket revenue, yeah. and you're going to get your sponsorship from your people at year in, year out. Yeah. I, I'm sure it takes a couple of years to get them really roaring, you know, unless you I've have, always like, heard the built-in. you're not, you, you're, you don't make money. You're one, you're two, you're break even, you're three is when you start to really make money. Yeah. It makes sense. Cause I think you have to get like, maybe again if i did it to your point like or you did like we may be able to attract different types of audiences which is interesting in and of itself but um if you're just starting it fresh but i I do think like to your point it's in a very interesting somewhat low risk way to get to get on you know get in the entrepreneurial circles out of curiosity just like thinking off the top of uh my head like if you were to start if if you're like a new entrepreneur and you decide okay like I'm going to I'm going to start an event like that's going to be my first thing because it doesn't require a ton of capital, build me a huge network. How would you think about doing it? Like the the Jesse Puji right out of Goldman. Yeah, I would probably try to f- find a space that's like newish, you know, cuz cuz obviously any space that uh one of the funny things about being a young entrepreneur by the way is you don't know much, much about these events and conferences cuz you've never really gone to them, but in Which theory is, I try to could find could be a good thing. Yeah, I'd find something that's like just a new category, like a, you know, crypto a few years ago. AI, AI generative right AI, now. yeah. Yeah, and then even like, can I, to your point, can I cut it down one more level, you know, or maybe two more levels, like AI for food or AI for B2B or something that feels a little angled. And then I would try to go find, you know, 10 or 20 of the most important people um, flatter the hell out of them. And, and even, you know, I don't think they, people don't usually want money, but maybe you pay them, but you get a few people who you're like, they, these are legit names. And, and then from there, I think start to build the website and a little bit of the marketing collateral and kind of go, Hey, I've got this awesome conference. It's one day, you know, and, and then I'd probably try to find some way to keep the venue pretty cheap or whatever. Uh, and then get enough momentum. And then, and then I think you can start to go, you know, get some sponsors, uh, and, and go on. There's a lot of selling, I think, on both sides in that beginning time to kind of get enough critical mass there that uh, th- that it's going to actually be an interesting event and worthwhile. I also would probably do a little bit of like thinking about the personas or the deals that will get done at my conference yep. and then making sure that like that's a big part of whoever's coming to the conference. Like it's going to, you know, one of the reason buyers go to conferences, it, it, you know, and I never thought about this until a few years in was like, they they have the same efficiency issue. Like they're like, I don't want to take ten phone calls to learn the latest AI technology, or in e-commerce. Like I don't want to have twenty vendor calls with all you guys building e-com tech apps. 
I just want to, I can walk around and in five minutes I could meet this person. I could see this. I could get, and so there's actually on the buying side of things in conferences, the boots and everything are an efficiency for them. Totally. Um, and so that's another thing to think about. Like, why is it making to make the person who's spending money, like the buyers of something, why is it going to make their life easier or better? Yeah. So you basically, you're saying like you niche down as much as humanly possible where it's not like a massive conference day one, but it's like a very clear focus to the conference and reverse engineer what is a sub niche that is a valuable sub niche where like if you can make deals get done or like a uh, strong network or efficiency happen between the attendees like they'd find it valuable enough to come back next year and start there and i guess the second piece of it also is like if you're an alex lieberman out of michigan a jesse uh you know out of uh finance and you don't have this network my view would be like Maybe if you don't feel like you have the network to to even be able to attract the attendees, find someone who's an expert in the space, like who is yeah. established in the space That's and basically one. be like, I'll be your operational partner. I'll run the whole event. Just help me bring people in the door. Maybe if you need help with uh, capital, you ask them. And yeah, I would just go from there. I was even thinking to myself, like as I was brainstorming, what event would I host right now? I think there's two. It would either be an annual um uh golf event like a just like an annual for people in the startup scene who love golf uh i would host like a every year go to a different awesome golf course and meet founders i i don't know how much that would make that just feels like it'd be a lot of fun the second one that i actually think could be a really interesting one is so there's a hold co conference um and mm. i think it's in cleveland ohio but it's mostly for people who do hold co's that buy like that are buying right. you know like five to $50 million EBITDA businesses. I think like a startup studio uh, conference could be a really fun one, like host it yeah. with 50 to 100 people who are all trying to incubate businesses and, and hire operators. And I just think it'd be a great way to learn. And I think, I think people would come if they thought there was like a possible chance that they could get one piece of information that would help them figure out their next business. The derivative of that would be hosting an operators conference for people who are in the throes of running businesses. And it's all around process, like everything to operate businesses exceptionally. And to me, right. use it as a funnel to find great people for your studio. Yeah, there's. I think someone ran something like this. And I was always like the no conference conference. Like, oh, yeah, I've heard just of Just get the people together and don't have any sessions because <laughs> nobody that, pays attention to the sessions I, anyway. I love that. But I do think you have to think about like in, in, the, in the studio one, I like that. But you have to think about like, what are the buyer's? Whoever's gonna pay the bills, or like, like who? What's the marketplace essentially? Right. Yeah. Every every conference essentially has a marketplace, and that one feels like, you, you know, talented people who who are interested in becoming CEOs, and then like the studios on the other side with their ideas and their how they work or whatever. I'm just thinking out loud, but the totally there or or LPs, right? Like could be another version of the conference, which is like, oh, and then we have LPs who are interested in the studios and. So the more you can think about like who's going to make deals and, and how that works, that's how you get. Yeah, I think that's, that's an interesting one. Like, yeah, it's like three sides of the marketplace. You have the people running businesses, you have the people starting the businesses, and you have the people funding the businesses. And so then, you know, who could exhibitors be? It could be, you know, if Jesse Puji, every time he spins up a business, is using the same sort of software as kind of like the core offering or the core things in his business to run the operating system, like those could be interesting sponsors in the business. Some things just leave you guessing, like why are yawns contagious? But you know who doesn't leave you guessing? MailChimp. MailChimp analyzes data points from billions of emails to offer up personalized recommendations to help you improve areas like email content and audience targeting. Get started today at MailChimp.com slash guesswork. That's MailChimp.com slash guesswork. Let's finish off the episode with a quick startup AMA. Matthew Brown, thank you for writing in. Question from Matthew Brown is, when have you decided to double down on a business versus leave and start a new one? So Jesse, I'm going to put this to you first. How did you decide when it was time to close down Puforia? Like, how did you know that you had given it enough of a chance <laughs> as your <laughs> the, the the low laugh as you hear the question. Had you know that you had given it enough of a chance versus your other businesses that you've started? Had you know it was time to double down on them? Yeah, I, I would start by saying I'm not sure I'm that great at this. Um, and this is where like for me, tenacity sometimes can be a con. Like I, I'm like, I'm like, no, I'm going to make this work. 
Right. And I, I think there's a couple of things that in that case led to and, and how I think about this question. One is like, I think ultimately you have to time box everything. And so if you're a new new founder starting out, I typically say like, give yourself two years. If you don't have anything going interesting within two years, then probably you should do something else. Two years is a long time if you're giving it your all every day. Um, and I do think you have to time box things. And that, that, that's part of the answer there was just said, hey, if we're not at this number by this time, then we're just going to, we're going to decide that we're not. And even like you were talking about product market fit for Kahani, like they're, even that has to be time bound this year, which we're just like, Hey, if we don't see these kinds of things, like, you know, yeah, we can make smaller adjustments or we can like at some point <clears throat> just make a big adjustment. And, and yep. sometimes one thing I learned, um, from the red ventures folks and Rick, Rick is like, sometimes it doesn't matter why it's not working. I think a lot of times the problem solvers in us want to go like, Oh, well, no, it's just this variable. And it's just this variable. And sometimes it doesn't matter. Maybe you're not the right person. Maybe it's not the right thing. Like, Sometimes just doing something different and changing is is just like a very positive thing. Um, yeah. And so like don't don't keep doing what you've been doing and expect different results. I think that's part of it. And then in that specific instance, and I think in a few instances, like one question I do like to ask myself based on what I've learned once I'm running the business is if I am really successful, now knowing what I know about this business, if I am really successful, how big do I think it will be? And in that business, I think it just it just felt like we could grind at it for many years and it wouldn't be more than a $10 million business. And that just wasn't that interesting. And so that's the other thing, which is like creating sort of the bar or the, you know, the threshold for yourself around what has to become interesting with how you're using your time. What do you have to believe about what's going to end up happening? And so I think sometimes when you get into something, you may even go, oh, no, I, th- I think it could start working or maybe it is working. <clears throat> but you look at it and you go, yeah, but even if it works, it, it, the biggest of my wildest dreams it's not going to be that interesting of a business or it's not going to meet my sort of personal return on time. Totally. And so I think that's the other big one that, that sticks out for me in that decision. Yeah, I think that makes total sense. And just you know, to provide specifics on how I'm thinking about it right now for the plunge, basically my view is I want to give it my all from like a go-to-market perspective. And, and I think um, by the time this episode comes out, the Founders Journal of like my growth strategy for the plunge will have come out. But basically it's like three things. It's optimizing... Um, reservations for our Kickstarter campaign through paid ads. It's events. So I've gotten five ambassadors in different cities in the US to have the game and host weekly events. And it's short form social. And my view is if by the end of the Kickstarter campaign, doing all of those things doesn't lead us to hitting our goal, a, a large change probably needs to happen because I really feel like I've put my best foot forward. And that's okay. Up until that point, it until I get to that point, I will continue to do everything possible to sell as much of this game as possible. And to your point about like, is it a big enough business? Like I I ask myself that with the plunge all the time. And the way that I think about it is I, I will keep at this business if not only the plunge sells well in the Kickstarter campaign, but I feel like this could be the next generation version of Nerf. Like if I think yeah. this could be like the next big brand for adults and kids to have fun outside... I think that is a fun business that I'd like to be involved with for a long period of time. If not, maybe different decisions have to be made in the future. And either way, it's not a good or a bad. It's just, to your point, it's a function of time and what is worth spending your time on. Yeah, and I think the only thing I'd say is like, that's a very, my view of it, and I think yours to some degree is is a very business-minded view, like return on time and whatever. You know, there's this famous story about the founder of Pandora. I think he spent seven years on the like music algorithm project or whatever, and so I don't, you know, I don't know, Matthew, what you're working on, but like, if it's something that you genuinely feel passionate and excited about, you should keep working on it until you don't feel that way anymore. Because, you know, there are famous stories of people spending five, 10 years on something before it cracks. And I think totally. I, I wouldn't do that because you want it to crack. Like if you're, if you're doing it, you know, for a business reason, that's probably not the right reason. But if you're doing it because you're passionate about that thing existing in the world, I think that's kind of a different set of parameters. Yeah, I I, I think it's such a good point because it's like, if, if I was starting Morning Brew today and I got six months into the thing and only had 5,000 subscribers, I would probably be quitting it if if we're looking at it from through the lens of business. But if I'd operated in that way when we started the thing in 2015, the business wouldn't be, you know, 250 person company with 15 different products now. So like right. you can't just look at it through the business lens. You have to also look through the lens like, is this bringing you energy in your life? And kind of don't give a shit what people say about it. is it worth the time to put into it? Okay, 
this was a fun conversation. Thank you, Matthew, for the question. And uh, for all the misfits out there, please send us in any questions you have that you want Jesse or I to answer. Shoot your most pressing challenge or your biggest question related to your business to the crazy ones at morningbrew.com. And we will catch you next episode. Later, guys. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode of The Crazy Ones. If you're an entrepreneur or a builder and want more great startup content, make sure to subscribe on our YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcasts.